Hello again class and welcome back to uh, module 4. Um, this module also at the end of the video has complete instructions on how to do assignment number 2. So uh, make sure that you uh, come back to this video if you need some help for assignment number 2. This module is taken from the Adams and Lawrence textbook chapter 4 and the title is Designing a Descriptive Study. Um, so what we're going to get into in this chapter, in this module, is the idea of what um, you're going to do actually yourselves for your research project, which is where 150 points out of the 500 for this semester come from. Um, a descriptive study seeks to answer who, what, where, when, and how. And the assignment number two will require you to do very, very briefly exactly this for a uh, just, just a really quick analysis of some project, whatever you want to choose. I would recommend that maybe in assignment number two you start thinking about what you want to do for your own research project, but it's not mandatory, um, although it would certainly be helpful for you. Um, descriptive studies are appropriate for when you're trying to understand prevalence and trends, um, which in the social sciences is almost everything we do, um, and when trying to explore a phenomenon in depth, so why do people do this? Uh, why do people react this way? Why do people behave this poorly? And when examining a phenomenon in a different population, um, why are they different from us? Um, so those types of questions. Uh, survey research is asking people to report on their own attitudes and behaviors. The advantages, of course, of survey research is that you gain insight into thoughts and feelings that cannot be readily observed because you actually have to get some kind of feedback from people. You can't just sit aside, sit um, to the side somewhere and watch. Um, the cons of it are that it's um, uh, there's built-in social desirability bias, uh, which is a social psychology phenomenon. Um, participants respond based on the way they want to be perceived. So if you ask a white Christian male, what do you think about um, a Muslim male, um, they may have some very different thoughts about that but they're not going to state it publicly. Um, for example, love the cartoon here. Um, the, uh, the, the social desirability bias between women who ask whether, do you like my outfit? Do you like this dress? Does this dress make me look in which way or another? Um, so people will lie just because it's not polite to tell the truth sometimes. So that's what we have to deal with on surveys. It's important that they be anonymous, but even still, you don't know, even if somebody in the quiet of their own private home, whether they are even willing to be honest with themselves. An interview is where you sit down one-on-one -on -one and have a conversation directed by the researcher in person, over the phone or via email, works as well. Uh, the advantages of these interviews are the participants may take this more seriously due, a one, due to a one-on-one -on -one format. I found that myself. That was very one-on-one um, -on -one interviews for me were critically important to the studies which I've done. Um, it's likely improve, increases the response rate and the accuracy. Uh, an interviewer is privy to additional information. Um, I did all of my interviews at the Belafonte de Colsey Center. The context of where I did the interviews was integral to the information that was shared. And you can ask follow-up and clarifying questions if you don't really understand it because you've got the person's name and you can get back in touch with them. The cons of the one-on-one -on -one interview is that it's not hardly anonymous. Um, it, you can do them anonymously if you want to go into a great deal of setting up um, process. Um, it increases the social desirability bias above and beyond what you would find in a survey situation. And the interviewer bias is inherent in it. Um, uh, because I will read people's cues based on the perspective that I have of previously being deeply embedded in a fundamentalist Christian religion. So if I'm interviewing somebody who has let me know certain information about them being a fundamentalist Christian, I'm going to already be interpreting their answers through the lens of my life. So interviewer bias is inherently problematic on a one-on-one -on -one interview. Um, two types of interview. The structured interview is that I'm going to ask you all these questions. Chum, 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 chum. Go down the checklist, mark off questions that you've asked. A semi-structured interview is that, you know what, I know what I want to learn from this individual, but I'm not going to direct this conversation 100% because I may say something that's a trigger for this individual. And when I hit that trigger, the individual may give me just an enormous amount of insight into their own personal life. So when I hit one of those triggers and the conversation goes off the rails, I'm going to let it go off the rails because I want to find out where this trigger is going to take me. 
Um, so that's a semi-structured interview. Informed consent is very important that you do it before the interview, before the participation in the study, research, survey, even a survey sent out by SurveyMonkey has to have informed consent. Do you click? Do you give consent? Uh, by clicking on next, you give consent. Those types of things are always informed consent. Um, and they are informed about what the study is about, who's conducting the study, in our case always Florida Atlantic University, what their participation involves, including what they do and how long it will take. Um, this is going to take 20 minutes. Any risks and benefits to the participation? Um, if you answer some of my surveys, I have to put on there that there is a risk that they may feel um, that the survey is asking them to challenge their religious beliefs. That's a risk to individuals. I don't want somebody to have a crisis of faith after taking one of my surveys. Um, so I have to warn them. Some of the questions may force them to look critically at their faith in a way that they've never looked at their faith before. Um, and they can withdraw without any penalty. You can stop taking the survey, you can get out of here. Um, I'm, I'm going to have a meltdown now because you challenged my belief system or my worldview and I'm stopping right now. And they have to do that. They have that flexibility. And participants actively consent. It can't just be like, oh, okay, I'm going to trick this person into participating because I caught them on the breezeway. You have to say, you are now at this instant in time participating in this survey. Um, so they have to actively consent. Yes, I understand. Questionnaires. Um, participants respond to the questions on paper or online. Um, the advantages of this is that it does allow for anonymity, which can reduce social desirability bias. Multiple participants can complete at the same time, and administration is really easy. Uh, methods for questionnaire administration. You can administer the questionnaire in person, stand on the breezeway, ask people questions as they walk by. Can you stop for a minute? I need to ask you certain questions, blah, blah, blah. That's a, in person, you get a high response rate because they'll feel guilty by saying no. A uh, researcher can clarify the questions if they didn't understand. It's fairly inexpensive to do. Disadvantages is that it's work intensive. You have to be there standing outside in the sun the whole time that you're doing this. And participants name may not believe they are anonymous. Will he recognize me from when I saw him in the LGBTQA Resource Center? Uh, does he know I'm gay? Did he see me there? So those types of things may come into people's minds and, um, and, and, and stop their participation or give participation bias inherently. Um, if you mail out the questionnaire, the, um, the advantages are that it's relatively convenient, but it's very expensive to mail out a questionnaire. If you're going to do a thousand surveys, all of a sudden you have spent $500 on postage, not including the paper, not including how much it costs to get it back again because you want them to not have to pay for the stamp back, so you're going to have to double your postage in order to get them to mail it back. And it has very low response rate. Nobody opens their mail anymore, let's face it. Um, an online survey, lots of advantages, very convenient, it can reach a large number of people, you can reach people around the world. Um, it has a satisfactory response rate, better than mailing it out, and it's really inexpensive. The disadvantages, um, there's, we'll get into some of the disadvantages. Some of them are better than others, worse than others. Observational research um, involves observing and recording the behavior of humans or animals. Uh, the advantages are it focuses on what people are actually doing. Um, not what they say they do. So they may, it takes out kind of that um, social desirability bias because if you're just sitting there watching them, then they may pick their notes, which is really embarrassing. But if you're just sitting there watching them and they don't realize it, they're going to behave differently than they would if they didn't know you were watching. Um, cons, it's time consuming. You got to sit out there on the street corner. You got to be there at the Belafonte de Colsey Center like I was for two years, every week, once a week. Um, it's prone to observer bias. Uh, yeah, I'll admit it. Um, I'm a white male in a black community center, and um, I saw things differently. Um, I, I, I didn't understand a lot of the psychology when I first started that shaped male, black male behavior um, on the basketball court or in the study groups. Um, I was there on parole violation nights for ju juvenile delinquents. Um, I never had any inkling to break the law when I was a youth, so I don't know what those things are, and I judge because I did not have that kind of an upbringing. So it's very easy for me to say, well, why did they do that? That's ridiculous that they did that. Well, I was raised in a small, white small town like Warden June Cleaver, um, raised little Leave it to Beaver. 
So combating observer bias, you have to um, have blind observers and, and carefully train the observers, test inter-rater reliability by checking his observations and her observations against each other. Do they observe the same thing? Um, so you have to have two people at the same site observing and seeing whether they saw the same thing. And have structured observations so that they have to fill in a form that says, you know what, um, this is, is it this way or is it that way? That way there's no subject to interpretation. Uh, ways to collect the data with observational research. You can just write out a narrative, which is what mine all was. I blogged. I took pictures. I had cameras. I had a multimedia blog. That's how it actually started. Uh, it was part of my multimedia journalism course. And so I built in a narrative. A white guy on mlkboulevard.blogspot.com was my blog. Um, the checklists, how long you were there, what dates you were there, task completion time, reaction time, latency, and a rating scale, all of those mechanisms the book talks about. Types of observations, covert, um, yeah, researchers don't reveal that they're observing. I could hardly do that. I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to be very overt. I wanted people to know that I'm there. I wanted people to share with me their opinions and come up and talk to me and, uh, and find out what they felt about me being there. Were they offended that this white guy is in their community center um, acting kind of like naive a lot of time. I wanted to find out what they felt about my naivete. Um, contrived, it's, um, did you set it up for research purpose? Mine, I, I went to great lengths to make sure that it was not contrived, that nobody felt that I was contrived. Um, Non-participant researcher isn't involved in the direct situation, so you can just kind of stay aside, and I was definitely a participant, so the way I did it. Archival research means just digging into the archives at the library, um, do Google searches and reading other people's journals and reading on secondary data that other people have published. Um, it can save time and resources by not collecting your own data. Like I mentioned in Module 3, the United Nations has indices all available for every possible imagining thing throughout the world. Um, that data is there and it's available for you. You just have to go and look for it. Um, and there's very few ethical violations when you're using secondary data. The disadvantages of archival research is that um, you have to find the right source, which isn't always easy, and you must decide how to use this data to test your hypothesis. Um, you might start into your research with this idea, okay, this is my hypothesis, I want to look at this, and then find no data. So then you have to ask yourself, can I tweak it just a little bit so that my hypothesis will work with this data, which isn't ideal, but it comes close so it will serve as a proxy. So then you have to tweak it and adjust things a little bit because you may not found a perfect fit, but you found a decent proxy. And um, so then you have to justify why you chose that as a proxy. Um, and as of always, there, the data was not collected with your hypothesis in mind. The data was collected with somebody else's hypothesis in mind, which is um, a certain disadvantage. And that's why you may have to find that it works as a proxy, not as an ideal set. Um, comparison of methods, go through these tables, there's just tons and tons of these tables, um, they're too lengthy to go over in the uh, video here, um, but make sure that you go back to them and, and, and look at the advantages and disadvantages of all of these things. It's a good summary for everything that we've just talked about. Validity, that was module 3, so all of these terms here are part of module 3, chapter 3. Uh, measurement validity, internal validity, and external validity have very different terms. And um, these are terms that I want you to use in your own research project and as you evaluate. And as you do assignment number two, these terms may come into play as well. So defining the population and obtaining a sample. So you have your sample, which is right here in the core. Then you have your subpopulation. And then you have your population. In assignment number two, this is going to be part of what you have to do. So I need you to think in very clear terms of, uh, of how to pull a sample out of a population and whether it's going to be a stratified sample. So this subpopulation is like looking at a stratified sample. Probability sampling or random sampling is the best kind. It's the gold standard in research methods. That's what you always want to do, but it's the most expensive. And um, you can't always do it. And you can't always... Um, and, and plus, sometimes you really don't want to do um, a, a, a probability sampling, and, and I'll show you in my example of assignment number two why a probability sample was not actually appropriate for what I wanted. Um, so it uses a random selection mechanism, um, and it talks about with replacement or without replacement, very important um, when you're doing very, very large samples. Types of probability 
um, sampling is you can get your simple random sample, the stratified random sampling, which was something I considered, and I'll mention it in assignment number two, how a stratified random sampling would work as and still remain as a probability gold standard type of sampling. And a cluster sampling, those are um, all valid ways to do a probability or random sample. Um, and here is table 4.2, tells you all of the features and steps in how to do simple random sampling. Um, stratified random sampling is much more detailed. Um, there's a few more steps involved. Make sure that you understand this if uh, this is how you're going to answer assignment number two. And cluster sampling, another full page of how to understand, and that's on table 4.4. Um, so you may have this as part of your assignment number two. Obtaining a sample from your population, how large should your probability be? We don't need to worry about this. This is part of PAD 4702. Um, in 4704, we don't have to do this. If you've already taken 4702, you've already learned this and probably already forgotten it because it's really, really complicated, so we're not even going to get into this. Um, but just to know that there is a mathematical formula to help you figure out how size, how, how large your sample needs to be. Non-probability and non-random sampling covers almost everything that we do. And most of the stuff which you will do in your careers will be non-probability sampling. Um, any method of sampling that does not rely on random selection. Plain and simple. Um, types of non-random sampling are convenient sampling, quota sampling, maximum variation sampling, which is very useful and once you understand it, and snowball sampling, which is my favorite, but it's the least scientific and it has huge propensity for bias, but you can get just tons of information about that little, tiny little segment of the population that is of particular interest to you. Um, but it's of limited usefulness as far as generalizability goes because snowball sampling is inherently biased within the population that is really, really, really excited about forwarding that on to their friend and putting it on their Facebook wall. So the convenient sampling, um, define your population, decide where and when you will be able to find a sample from that population and collect data. Screen out those who do not belong in your population. This is why it's very useful. You screen out those who do not belong in your population. You're not trying to be um, random in this process. You're trying to get the most information you can about the population that you're interested in so it's actually an active process of eliminating the people that aren't going to be of any use to you. Um, which is why we use it most often in research in the um, public administration field. Quota sampling, not going to get into it. Maximum variation sampling, I love this one. Um, read about it, understand it. Be, you, you will, there will be some circumstances where this will be the absolute best thing that you ever want to do in your careers. Um, maximum variation can be very, very informative and it's much more affordable than a true random sample, but it comes fairly close to actually providing the kind of reliability and generalizability that you would get from true random sampling. Um, and here's snowball sampling, um, one, two, and three, four as the categories there. That screen there is covered up because there's nothing in it there. This is over here, this is part of point number two. So it's a very long write-up on that table 4.8 and um, understand how to use it. It's the cheapest one to use and it's the one that can penetrate really, really deep and uh, get a huge response rate, um, but of very little use as far as generalizability goes. Types of sampling techniques, here they are. Neat little table, probability sampling, non-probability sampling. So let's get into assignment number two. Assignment number two, once again, worth 20 points. This is what the Blackboard page looks like when you drill down through content assignments. It will then open up assignment number two folder. The first link here is to the actual assignment instructions and the sample answers. Um, what I'm going to cover off in the next slides are on this document right here, assignment number two instructions and sample answers. If you want to do a real easy template in answering me, um, download this template here and the it will look exactly like what you're going to see on the screen here and then you, there's forms in there, there's points in there, already bullet points, uh, where you can just type in your answers and send it back to me. And um, practice 2.4 from uh, module number two, this may be useful if you want to, the, it's just an image which I put up there on here which um, if you want to do a little bit of research and if you're fairly certain that you really know what you want to do your research project on, go ahead and do that little bit of research now so that you can answer assignment number two better because any work you do on assignment number two that is on the same track as your research project will save you time and energy later. So if you want to spend two hours on this instead of the one hour that I expect, 
but it's going to be part of your research project, go ahead and spend the two hours because it'll save you two hours of work later if you do more work at this point in time and get this really, really fleshed out. So um, there's no limitation. Um, I gave very short answers as I might expect you to provide, but if you're actually going to do your research project on this, um, go ahead and um, uh, do the work now. And my UPS guy is out tired, so I'll just stop. So let's get right into it. The um, assignment number two starts with um, practice 4.1, which is a frame from the chapter there. Um, it's due on Monday, May 26th, at the end of the day. <clears throat> that means 11.59. So what, they, what I want you to do to start here is I want you to identify a descriptive study based on your topic. Um, that was why I put that reference into there from chapter or module two, um, because that would be kind of like a re peer-reviewed article or story um, or a descriptive study um, based on your topic. Um, you don't have to actually base it on a descriptive study. You can base all of your work on an idea for a descriptive study. So if you just got an idea in your head about what you want to do for your research project, base all of your answers on what's in your head. Don't go out there and kill yourself reading peer-reviewed journal articles at this point in time. I just want to know what's, what you're passionate about and why you're passionate about it. And that should come out in the answers that you give here. So come up with a few descriptive questions of who, what, where, when, and how based on your topic. And choose or modify one that has the strongest rationale in that the research literature suggests that one of the following studies is warranted. Um, a study based on an understanding of prevalence or trends, an in-depth examination of that topic, or an examination in a different population that has been studied than the one that has been studied. So, 2A, B, or C will be what you're going to go off of. So here's what I did. My research question that I had in mind was, how can community workers, oops, a typo, oh well, how can community workers in the inner city span the different levels of government and work more efficiently with other street level bureaucrats and nonprofit organizations? This is actually out of my dissertation. So I was a participant observation researcher in Liberty City and I saw huge layers of uh, huge amounts of duplication in between what federal government programs were funding and what state governments were funding and city governments and county governments and school districts and the nonprofit organization because I was in a nonprofit organization embedded as a participant observation researcher in Belafonte de Colsey Center. So who is impacted? Um, the high needs at risk population who rely upon public goods and services. Um, Liberty City is a high needs, high risk population. Uh, what happens? They end up going all over the community for the services that they need. If, if the father in the family has a, is on parole, he goes to a parole officer. <clears throat> um, if um, there is a child in school, they're dealing with the school district. If there's a preschooler, they're dealing with after school child care. If there's an elderly person in the home, they're dealing with elder care. Um, if there is uh, uh, any incidents of HIV, then they're dealing with health care from the county level. All of these layers of, of high needs, high risk populations were being dealt with by different gateways into the government provision of public goods and services. So where does this happen? In my case, Liberty City. When does it happen? Most uh, daily. Um, but what I saw at the Belafonte de Colsey Center was a lot of stuff that's correlated and pivots around the interface of families with the schools. And when that has a failing to it, what the Belafonte de Colsey Center pitches in and mediates the difficulties that families are having with the schools. And that's what the de Colsey Center focuses on. So that's when it happens. How does it happen? Well, it happens because federal programs are not designed to work with the state programs. And state programs don't work well with county and city programs. And the nonprofit programs are just a bunch of band-aids that are going in working on the symptoms of the disease without actually treating the disease, which is this inability of the other layers of government to coordinate their efforts with each other. So, as an answer to question number two, it says choose or modify one that has the strongest rationale in that the research literature suggests that one of the following studies is warranted. Um, an understanding of prevalence and trends, that didn't fit my needs. An in-depth examination, that wouldn't fit my needs. And an examination into a different population that has been studied. No, I wanted to look specifically at the Belafonte de Colsey Center. So my answer to part number two was to look into my research question. I have chosen to do an in-depth examination. OK, practice 4.2 is the window for the next part of this assignment number two. And it asks you to evaluate methods for a descriptive study on your topic. 
I'm not going to go into it too much here in the video, um, but it asks you to either choose a survey method or an observational research method or an archival research method to get into it. How are you going to get into this topic that you identified in practice 4.1 on the previous screen? Um, in my case, I chose to do observational research, obviously, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. In yours, you may choose to talk about archival research or surveys. Um, and then you have to answer the questions associated with them. Part number two asks, of the methods that you could use for your study, which one would you choose? I chose observational research. And number three, part number three, would you need to obtain informed consent to carry out the study you chose? Why or why not? Informed consent was part of your reading in chapter four. So my answer is, the three ways suggested and my conclusions are that part, part number A, evaluated. I looked at surveys. Um, they're not safe for me to conduct in Liberty City. Um, observational research was the one that I chose. I could get involved with the Belafonte de Colsey Center. I had that offer and I chose to get involved and that's why I chose that. Archival research, I'd already looked into archival research and I hadn't been satisfied with what I found. Other people <clears throat> weren't seeing the problems the way I was seeing them. So that's why I needed to do my own in-depth observation, in-depth research. Um, part number two, the way I answered that is, I would choose to start with observational research primarily because it is easy to read what others have written about my archival research, um, but I honestly see the problem differently than they have seen it. For this reason, I would choose to start from scratch to see what I could identify as the structural dynamics that are at work in Liberty City. Part number three asked whether I would need to get informed consent. Absolutely. Um, it was required of me to be involved in any way with the Belafonte de Colsey Center because I was embedded in that organization and I would be exposed to children and youth. Practice 4.3, the final part of assignment number two, define the population and decide how to collect a sample for your study. Recall the descriptive study you chose in practice 4.2, that was the last screen my end of my participant observation. Who or what is your population of interest? Now, this is where it gets interesting. Should you do probability sampling based on the goal of your study? Is it feasible to do probability sampling? And number four, um, choose a specific sampling procedure based on whether it's probability or non-probability sampling. So choose a specific sampling procedure and outline how you will obtain a sample from your population. So I chose observational research, part number one. Part number two, my population of interest would include street level bureaucrats, not the actual citizens in living in Liberty City. Now, it, and this, this is where you have to actually think things through. I'm not interested in studying the people who live in Liberty City. I'm interested in studying the street level bureaucrat because the street level bureaucrat is frustrated in how they are able to deliver the public goods and services from their specific unit of government. So they, they are my population of interest, the street level bureaucrats, the community workers, the volunteers who work at the Belafonte de Colsey Center. Um, so it's important that I focus on these individuals, not the program recipients, because the street level bureaucrats are the individuals who will be able to tell me about the obstacles that they face as they strive to cope with upper level managers and elected individuals who seem to have different goals sometimes than the actual street level bureaucrat. Okay, part number three asked, uh, um, what type of sampling? Originally I thought I would do probability sampling, but then I realized that I already had a very good idea of who my study population was. I already defined my study population very, very clearly. So I chose to do non-probability sampling so that I could focus specifically on my study population. And this is when you choose to do non-probability sampling is when you know exactly who you want to study and you want to study them in depth. It's not so much about how random they are, it's about how much you can find out from them. And so that's why I chose to go with non-probability sampling in this project. Um, I could do that better with non-probability, I could get that depth in that I needed by, with non-probability sampling. Now that I've chosen non-probability sampling, I have choices from within non-probability sampling to actually get out and do my sampling. So part number four is about that. Because I only have immediate contact with the community workers who are at the Belafonte de Colsey Center, I have decided to use snowball sampling to reach much deeper into the community where I can't go. Um, they all know other community workers and the de Colsey Center also agreed to send out an email for me through their mailing list and this is an ideal environment for a snowball sample. That's why I like it so much. And it was able to get really, really deep into the uh, community where I would never have any access. That's the end of uh, Module 4 and all of the instructions for assignment number two. Let me know if you have any questions by email. Thanks.